I'm Abdullah Schleifer, and I'm a resident here in Cairo, Egypt. I'm from New York originally. I was born in New York, grew up in New York, went to school in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, came back to New York and lived and worked there for a couple of years, and then ended up overseas, and I've been living overseas for the past 40 years. I sense that this is all coming from people who believe in God. I can't comprehend God. And I really went into a state of deep depression because of that. I mean, I really was, in a, I was already in a spiritual crisis coming to Morocco after having experienced the Stalinization of the Cuban Revolution and realized, oh my God, it's, it's all happening all over again. It's like darkness of noon and it's, you know, it's a monster. When people talk utopia, on Monday, there's a concentration camp waiting down the line on Friday. You know, that's the price of utopia. Because the man who thinks he has the capacity to make utopia for the millions is also ready to sacrifice millions, you know, for that vision. Whether it's a communist vision or a fascist vision or, you know, whatever. Or an extremist Islamist vision. So, uh, yeah, so I felt very bad. And I really went into a state that uh, clinically in clinical materials terms would be described as a nervous breakdown. And um, I understood it as, um, as a visionary journey to hell. Because all this, everything I suffered from in that state, the inability to sleep, burning, or fever, all are symptoms of hell, which I did not have um, implanted in me by a religious background. In other words, it isn't like I grew up on fire and brimstone. No one, heaven and hell, you never talked about that in my household. I didn't really read the Bible for meaning in English until I went to college. Uh, so, but I could recognize the symptoms because in college I started reading Dante and later, you know, and whatever. And then, you know, but I knew them as a literary trope. And now I was experiencing it. I was experienced. So I, in the end, I've come to appreciate that particular moment as what I would call a visionary journey to hell. And I know other people who've experienced that same thing. In other words, again, God finds you where he will. And, you know, some people are blessed with a vision of paradise. And others, we... Uh, so I came out of it. I said, well, I still don't know about God, but I sure know that hell is real. Hell is, rea is real. It's there. I've tasted it. I've tasted it in this life. It's like a veil was take, lifted and I saw into... You know, and, and my whole environment, I perceived in the context of hell. I'm trapped here forever. I'm, I can't see. You know, I mean, it was very interesting. So coming out of that, I slowly make my way back to America. Slowly. The only way I got back to America, I had to go via Havana. That was the way I was taken. I finally get back to America. I'm back in America. And, and I remember the first day I get on a subway in New York. And so this is Satori on the subway, okay? I mean, that's how I'll chapter it. I'll, title it when I finish my uh, personal history. Satori on the subway. I'm on the subway, first day back in New York. And of course, you know, the thing about the New York subway is everybody's sort of sitting there self-contained, right? I mean, to such a degree that if you look at another guy's newspaper, he gets upset. You're invading his privacy. Oh, look at you. What? How dare you, you know, read my... <laughs> and nobody's recognizing anything. I mean. So some girl is standing there and some guy's like, you know, feeling her up. Nobody sees anything. Nobody does anything. You know, I mean, any number of odd stuff, you know. And the only person who talks to you is some crazy old lady who says, how are you, Sonny? Says, oh, a human being. Well, I'm fine, ma'am. Well, be careful because the Martians are coming tonight. So the only one who's even human is a lunatic, you know. And the sane ones are just utterly, you know, and it, it's... Uh, or maybe some guy who's trying to hit on a girl will talk, you know. But I mean, but people do not engage in that sort of old-fashioned, polite acknowledgement, which you can still find in, old, in some British villages, you know, to this day, where people will say, good morning, good evening, how are you? You know, whatever, to stra semi-strangers or their neighbors. And then I, went, I remembered getting on a bus. I used to travel the buses in Morocco, because I didn't have much money. And in the bus, you'd get on a bus, it'd be empty. And then ordinarily, I would do what any good Western and polite Western does, you go sit a couple rows away from the driver. You know, you don't go sit next to him. I mean, what is that? That's weird. Then a Moroccan gets on, and he goes sits right next to the driver. He feels compelled he has to do it, just as we feel compelled, oh no, unless we're introduced, this, nobody exists. 
And he says, Salam Aleikum. And the driver says, Aleikum Salam. And then they talk. And then another guy, he comes and sits next to the guy who's sitting as a driver. And, you know, now they acknowledge each other. Now, they could end up killing each other. You know, maybe they discover from enemy tribes and they pull daggers. Again, but they're not killing each other as strangers. I mean, they've acknowledged each other as human beings. And that's very important. And, and, and so I sensed that at that moment. I said, my God, you know. And I still enough of a Marxist, in a way, to phrase it in my mind and saying, you know, this may be the future. You know, it's scientific, it's this and that. But this is not the way man is meant to live. And that other thing may be decadent and whatever, reactionary, whatever, but that's the way people are meant to live, you know? They're meant to greet, acknowledge each other and, you know. And so I really, so I went home, this little flat I had on the Lower East Side. It was my, my second day back. And I pick up this copy of the Quran that I've been reading in English and getting nowhere with. First of all, Quran is not a narrative, all right? And Western culture is a narrative culture. We're used to reading things that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the Quran isn't. It isn't. It's organized arbitrarily by size. It has it's the components everywhere. You know, I mean, that's why there's a huge scholarship on trying to make a narrative understanding of when, which surahs came when and what. And what it really is is it's a collection of divine flashes. You know, it's like like in a literary set, flash, flash, flash. And that's why I think a lot of Westerners who become Muslims are very attracted to the story of, of Joseph. Because in the Quran, one of the longest narratives is the story of Joseph. And it's a fascinating story about Joseph and how he rises up and you know, this and that. And, or the story of Mo. You know, there are short narratives that last for a page and a half. And they're very attractive to us because they resonate with you know, a biblical narrative. So I was getting nowhere with it as a text, as a narrative text. And I wasn't getting anything spiritually from it because the, the, the spiritual grace is in the Arabic, you know, and I, I'm reading it in English. But it's there. A majority of Muslims in the world who pray do not know Arabic. But they get something, just as you got it from the Latin Mass or from the Hebrew or from... You get it because there is something, I believe, implicit in a spiritual language that contains spiritual grace, as spiritual grace can adhere to a holy man or a holy spot, a sacred place. So it adheres to the, these languages that resonate with spirituality, either because they're revealed or they've acquired a patina. And again, I wasn't doing it. I wasn't reading it like an Indonesian Muslim who doesn't know Arabic, but when he says his prayers, he feels it here. He feels it. He experiences spiritual grace. So I was getting nowhere with it. So I came back and instead I treated it like the I Ching, you know. And I later found out that there is a Muslim equivalent of doing this. What I did, there is a you know, tradition of one of the ways, and that is basically you know, of getting an answer. Uh, what I basically said is, God, if you're there, you know, give me a sign. You know, give me something. And I closed my eyes and just flipped the pages and put my finger on the text. And there I read, um, and it appears twice in the Quran. It could be translated, know that God that you cannot comprehend God, but God comprehendeth all. Well, I took that as a direct, you know, like, okay, right. You know, I can believe in a God who tells me that I cannot comprehend him. That's, I got the message. So that's how I became a Muslim. I mean, you know, then a couple of weeks I find some shape. You know, the rest of it is just sort of history. But that's how I became a Muslim. That's my story.